Good morning and afternoon to you, um, depending on where you are. This is Stephen Downs welcoming you to our session today entitled Your Instant Decentralized Learning Community. And as you can see now, or you can't see because I just turned it off, uh, my Pixel 4 is producing a live transcript of what I'm saying as I talk. And this transcript will be available after our session. Now, I'm just going to put that away for now. We'll come back to the phone later on in case I get a phone call or something during the session. So I'm still waiting for people to join the chat. I don't see anyone in the chat. So I'll just say hello in the chat and uh, welcome you to this presentation. I should say a workshop. That would be more accurate. The, uh, the, the topic is, as I say, your instant decentralized learning community. And as a result, this workshop, the success of this workshop is going to depend a lot on you. I can do a little bit. I can't do anything nearly like everything. And so really it'll depend on your participation. Now we might get a nice video out of it and some, some useful slides. And I guess that's a good thing. But my ambitions for this are a whole lot more. Uh, my ambition for this is that by the end of this session, we've created... A decentralized learning community at least for this conference and you know how long it lasts after that don't know it actually doesn't matter um, learning communities come and go that's the life of a learning community so I'm seeing people in the uh, chat now uh, Loretta from Latvia Umer from Bahrain Stephen from Liverpool so welcome to you Welcome everyone. Uh, room one from Trinidad. <laughs> Sorry, this is Denny from Trinidad and Tobago. Claudia from Berlin. Michelina from Italy. It's great to see people from around the world at this presentation. Now, um, speaking of this presentation, let's just get that going. Um, the uh, slides are available online www.downs.ca slash presentation slash 545 um, and it says just post the link in the chat if I could get somebody to type that out for me into the chat that would be wonderful um, but I do like to actually say the link out. You know, there are people who are not on the chat. There are people who are listening on audio only. Um, so it's always good to spell everything out. So here's the plan. The plan is, thank you, Natalie, uh, Natalia. Um, the plan is to create our virtual community as we go through the talk. We have an hour and a half. That sounds like tons of time. It is not tons of time. That time will actually disappear. And in fact, six minutes have gone already. And I'm only on the second slide. And the slides don't even say anything. <laughs> okay. So, you might be asking, first of all, why a learning community? And a learning community is something that can be used almost everywhere in a conference like this, or it can be added to a course. It can be created by anyone. You don't need someone like me. And in fact, it's better if you don't have someone like me because, you know, the, the tendency is for everyone to stop doing stuff and just look at, you know, the person who's presenting. But any self-organizing cohort of people can create a decentralized learning community. And then third, of course, it's a learning community. 
It facilitates functions important to learning. It helps with discussion. It helps with support for people, asking questions. One of my favorite learning communities is called Stack Overflow. And it's a website, but it's a website where people go to ask questions about computer programming. I haven't put the link there because you really have to be really, really interested in computer programming to enjoy Stack Overflow. But if you do, you probably already know about it and it's really useful. And the learning community will support creativity and sharing. And to me, those are the most important aspects of learning. You know, people focus a lot on the content, mastering the content. To me, it's about creating things. It's about sharing things. The idea of a learning community is, to a large degree, to work out loud. Uh, you know, we, we, we often think of learning as something that we do over and above whatever it is that we're doing. Um, but the idea here, to my mind, is that we're doing whatever we're ordinarily doing, but we're doing it in a way such that we're working out loud. At least that's how I think about it. Another question is, why decentralized? Why does that matter? And, and you know, and I, I will... I, I, you know, I will acknowledge, that, for example, that this conference has put up, you know, chats for, you know, here, here, here's a, a chat for, for this conference, right? There it is, right there in the middle of my screen, uh, which is great. And, and they've also put up some other things to support community. There are individual discussion areas. There are Q and A's with the presenters etc. But it's all centralized. And for a conference that might make sense. Uh, although if you're not at the conference, you're not really part of the community. So, you know, this barrier has been created. Um, but it's also fragile. A decentralized community will continue to work even if parts of it break down. If the conference website failed, um, for example, what would we do? Well, a decentralized community would continue to work. Also, and I'm sure the organizers could talk about this, a centralized community is expensive. It costs a lot of money to put that stuff together, to get everybody together on one site, to make sure all the streaming, all the boards, etc., are functioning properly. Um, Decentralized community eliminates bottlenecks and thus eliminates a focused high cost on any particular part. It might not save money overall. I don't know. I haven't done the calculation. But there's no single point where somebody has to pay a lot of money. And also, one of the things that we learned when we launched massive open online courses as decentralized communities is that it can work with any sized cohort, any number of people. You can have five people, you can have 500, 5,000, a decentralized community will continue to work. And so for me, these are all really good reasons to go decentralized. Another aspect is that in a decentralized community, more so than a centralized community, the focus is on cooperation rather than consumption. And that's a shift in perspective, and it's a hard shift in perspective, particularly when we've been brought up watching television, movies, online events, sporting events, etc. It's unusual for us to actually participate in the creation of whatever resource it is that we're using. But in a de decentralized learning community, that's exactly what's happening. And when we shift our perspective from consumer to participant, that certainly, that certainly changes your attitude toward what is produced and, and what you're reading. 
Now we have a question here on the board. How do you protect a decentralized community from being stalled by people not providing work? Most people consume, only few create. That's true. That is true. Uh, I, um, I've typically said, you know, expect a participation, participation rate of 1% or maybe one tenth of 1%, depends. Um, but so what? I mean, who cares? The people who are really benefiting are the people who are participating. Um, people who are, you know, not creating things or just observing, that's fine too. It's just they're not actually generating the discussion and the activity and, and therefore they're not benefiting as much from the community. It's okay if they watch. It's not a problem if they watch. You know, I've often said, you know, lurking, as it used to be called, is a valid form of participation. So it's not like people are getting a free ride or anything like that. The benefit comes from participating. Don't participate, you don't benefit. It's not a problem. The decentralized learning community is at the heart of what I've talked about over the years called personal learning environments. And that's kind of a picture that you should have in the back of your mind as, as we go through our workshop today. If you look especially at the diagram on the left, you can see that Really, it's a combination or a connection between a whole bunch of different online services. Some are hosted, some are personal, um, doesn't really matter. And you'll see those little orange boxes connecting them. We'll talk about that quite a bit in this session. But at the same time, uh, at the same time as we're talking about those little orange boxes, we're also connecting people. And what you should notice in the, uh, in the diagram is that, you know, although some pictures are bigger and others are smaller, indicating different levels of participation, there's no one person to whom everybody turns, right? Uh, rather, the communication goes from person to person to person to person. Uh, you don't listen to everybody all the time. Your, your attention is more focused than that. And in a, a decentralized online community, you know, you might only be looking at the 10, 20, 30 or whatever people closest to you. The maximum is usually what they call Dunbar's number, which is about 150. The community might be much larger than that, but you don't need to consume everything from the community. Those people who surround you, the 10, 20, 30, or 150 people, act as a filter for whatever is produced by the rest of the community. And that's what makes this work. The community provides its own moderation. The community provides its own scaling and its own dynamics. Next, why instant? What does it matter that we're doing an instant decentralized learning community? Well, there's, you know, I've, I've put in a link to a paper there, Praxis and the Indie Web, uh, which is, you know, kind of like inside politics. But the gist of that paper is that right now it's all too hard. Uh, it's too hard to build these decentralized communities. And, and it has a point. Totally has a point. And that's why people are... are turning to walled gardens like Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Content goes in, but it never comes out. Um, and so I wanted to see in this presentation what we can get done right away without worrying about all of that. Um, can we build something in this hour and a half? Because if we can do that, anyone can do that, right? Um, 
And then ask ourselves after, and it'll be after this talk, so we'll have to do it ourselves. Uh, what can we learn from that experience? And let's see what we do learn from that experience. So the idea of instant means also accessible, easier, possible, not too challenging, captures all of those ideas. And I think that's really important when building a decentralized learning community. So that's the setup. I want to emphasize every step in this process is optional. Again, if you just want to watch, that's fine. If you want to participate, that's also fine. The whole idea here is that when the community is decentralized, you don't have to use a particular technology. You don't have to participate in a particular way. Uh, choose your own learning technology. Choose your own resources that you look at. That way, each person has their own personalized experience of the community. That creates a diversity of perspectives. It gives us something to talk about. And also, it creates the greatest access and the greatest possibilities, the greatest set of possibilities for creativity in our community. Instant and now, says Marcus. Let's do a top 10 of tool concept ideas for community building. Interesting thought. So, where to begin? Now, we could begin with a website. Um, you know, most communities have their own website. Uh, think of it as the home. I know it's a decentralized community, but it's nice to have a home. Uh, I've listed a few resources there that allow you to create your own website. They're all free or nearly free. Um, more to the point, they're all easy. Um, there's instructions here for one of them called Wix. The whole idea of a starting website is to provide a starting place for your virtual community. So let's do that. Um, I've cheated a little bit and I created a blog on WordPress. And let's see if I can find it. <laughs> Which site, which site am I on? It doesn't tell me which site I'm on. Oh, well, that's just... I must have... There we go. My site is called Inted 2021. I'm going to choose a domain. I'm going to choose a layout. Let's pick something really simple because I don't want to do anything complicated. <laughs> Lots of choices, right? But I don't like all, I mean, I do like the pictures, but it's complicated. Pick a font care pairing, who cares? What features will I need? Skip for now. Select a plan. No, I want it free. Free, there we go. <laughs> Select. So you notice you have to scroll down for free. Now I hope you're watching as I did that. Okay, so here is my website. Okay, 2021. Oops. We'll get rid of the other content. I'll just write welcome, I guess. Uh, 
All right, that's good enough. <laughs> it doesn't need to be more than that. Continue. We already did this. <laughs> Select. See, WordPress is kind of centralized. And uh, so as a result, it keeps trying to get money from me. Launch my site. Launch my site. It won't launch my site. Let's see if it has launched it. And I just don't know. There we go. Launch site. <laughs> Back to my sites. Here we go. I don't know why it's being painful and not launching my site, but this is the sort of thing you have to expect. Visit site. Okay, good. Only you can see it until it's launched. And I click that. Skip purchase. Oh, goodness. I'm sorry. Here we go. It keeps wanting me to pay money. There we go. Choose a free site. See how hard it's making me to be free? This is the problem. I should have gone with Blogger. It's much easier. See, it's still trying to get me to pay money. You launched your site. There we go. Now people can see it. If you go to that website, you can see it. That was harder than it had to be. Fortunately, only I have to do that. So that was one screen. So, and, and I do want to emphasize that. Um, you saw how hard that was. Right? Um... And that's for an instant website. And, and you saw how hard WordPress made it for me to launch a free site. At every turn, it's asking me for money. At every turn, it's making it, making it easier for me to pay money to them. And that's one of the big challenges in building a distributed learning community is that you know, there's all kinds of hands reaching out for money. Um, and that's one of the appeals of Facebook and Twitter and the rest. You give up your independence, but at least they're not always asking, asking you for money. Okay, so Marcus is saying, are we supposed to join you on this website? You would need to post a name, link, join, etc. No, we don't need... Well, I mean, uh, you it's a good starting point, but you won't need to join me on this because we have a place to start already, which is this talk that I'm doing. But if you would like to look, uh, click on the link that Marcus has posted in the chat and pop on over to that website. Meanwhile, I'm going to continue. So, after the home website, which was a pain to create, if we think about this, there are different ways, different, different kinds of technologies, different kinds of platforms we could use in order to support our decentralized learning community. And... Often we'll use a combination of them. <laughs> and, and Marcus is also asking, what is the lesson? Either pay with dollars or your personal data. I don't know. I don't think it's that simple in either or. I, I think the lesson is that's the choice that WordPress is trying to force you into. But maybe there are better options. 
um, in the long term, and this is not today uh, yet, but in the longer term, we will be able to run these from our homes, from our own computers, off our own desktops. I guess you have to pay it in the form of buying hardware for your desktop. So, you know, in life, I guess, there's a cost to everything. And part of trying to build an instant distributed or instant decentralized learning community is to try to keep those costs as low as possible. And that means you have to buy a bit of annoyance. That means you have to sell a bit of personal data. Um, but it also means that uh, you can and should search for, um, you know, I was going to say shop around. I really don't like that phrase. That's why I didn't say it. But, uh, you know, the idea of a decentralized community is that we're not forced into buying high-priced alternatives that if there is a range of possibilities, if there is a range of options, um, we can choose lower priced options because they will become more available. That's the theory anyways. Different ways of creating this kind of access. Desktop applications, now those are not good for websites, but those are good for other tools, which we'll look at. Apps. Generally, um, I don't use them and I don't recommend them, although I do recognize that pretty much everybody has a phone these days, or I shouldn't say everybody, because really worldwide it's like half, less than half, but still, um, apps are very platform specific. I like web applications a lot. Um, hosted internet. You pay for hosting and then you run your own software on the internet. And some examples are uh, Reclaim or GoDaddy. I personally use Reclaim. Um, or cloud hosted applications, which right now are still a little expensive and hard to use. But a lot of what we're talking about in this workshop will be based on cloud hosted applications in the future. Okay, let's move beyond the website. Um, and this is something that you can do and would be good if you did. Um, and this is to create bookmarks and links. And, and let me talk about the theory here. The idea here, although some of these sites are a bit centralized, you know, there's only one place, for example, where Dijo or Digo, I don't know how to pronounce it, is located. The idea here is that we're collecting resources from all over the internet. And that's the first and most essential aspect of a decentralized learning community. The content isn't all in one place. The content is everywhere. And the idea of our learning community, at least one part of it, is to gather this content together. And Luis says we must be aware of data privacy and security. Um, agreed. Not totally on topic, but agreed. Um, so let's look at, say, Dijo or Digo. There we go. I had to click twice. So this is a simple bookmarking tool. Uh, collaborative bookmarking, which means that you can share. And I'm already logged in, but 
it's a fairly straightforward process to create an account. Now, again, you have to watch out. They're asking you for money, which is really annoying. But the idea here is now that you can add links. For example, a bookmark, an image, a PDF, or whatever. So I'm going to add a bookmark, and the bookmark I will add is this bookmark, because why not? And so I'll just paste that in there. There's the title. It picked up the title. Notice it asks for tags. We'll come back to that, but for now I'm just going to type in TED 2021, and I'll add it. Now, there's a lot more that you can do with Dejo, and the video that I reference um, in the slides, well, hints. Um, here we go, Intro to Collaborative book, Bookmarking. That video talks a lot more about the different things that you can do with it. But if you want, and you would like to contribute to this. So far we've talked about ways to create websites and ways to create bookmarks. Start a Dejo account and add some bookmarks to that and tag them I-N, well, hash I-N-T-E-D 2021. Uh, Marcus is saying, I disagree with selling your bit of data at your favorite website. Um, and it asks what the business models are that we are supporting here. And I want, I want to say something really important. Um, there isn't a right business model to support or not support. I get that a lot of people are not in favor of supporting commercial websites. I get that a lot of people are not in favor of supporting websites that trade services for information. And I'm sympathetic with those views. But this is supposed to be instant and easy. And part of that means a trade-off. And that's the way it's going to be for everyone for all services. Now you have to decide that point of trade-off for yourself. Some people say, I like to pay for what I'm using. I like to avoid hitting hidden models. I assume that's still Marcus. Uh, yeah, that's nice if you can pay. If you can't pay, you don't have that option. And I would like my model of a distributed online community to be inclusive in the sense that Everybody can play, whether they can pay or not. That means keeping the options open. We have business models we prefer, I guess that, but we can't force our preferences on other people. We each have to make these decisions for ourselves. So I hope some of you are creating bookmarks with Dejo. Um, and maybe you'll sort of, you can listen as I continue on while you do that, but I'm going to continue on and following from that is the bit about hashtags and oh, right, there it is. I'm just going to put that up there so that people can see the chat. Um, as, as I talk about this, um, the idea, like, and hashtags is an old idea, but it's a really good idea. Um, and the idea is that a group of people can create a sign or symbol that signifies that a resource, wherever it's located, belongs to that group of people. So in this case, where you're going to use INTED 2021 prefixed with this symbol, which we call the hash symbol. You're probably all very familiar with it. 
but usually we just use it to indicate you know a generic topic or something like that or you know hashtag Britney Spears or I guess these days hashtag free Britney etc which is fair enough if you think about it every one of those hashtags represents some community or another and for our learning community we're using the same technology now I've picked the conference hashtag and so I encourage you to use this conference hashtag when you're doing stuff even outside the conference if it relates to our topics so and the reason why we use this hash symbol is so that it just makes it easier to find with a search engine or whatever um, you know especially in the early days of hashtags people would use ordinary words like cloud right uh, well, you search for cloud, you're going to get a zillion results. Search for hashtag cloud, you'll get something more specific. You'll get discussions about the cloud. And that's why we use this hash symbol. They're most often used in micro content, social networking. I'm not a big fan of social networking for decentralized communities but a lot of people are and that's why I'm mentioning it here um, one con one site I'll specifically not recommend is Facebook uh, which I don't use and so I won't recommend it you want to use it that's fine um, I just have my own issues with it again it comes back to business models right we all have to pick the business models that we support. Uh, Luis is putting into the chat some other hashtags, hash, hash change, hash innovation, hash intend 2021, which is kind of neat, right? Because you think about it, it links up the concept of change and this conference and this community. So with Twitter, and let's, let's pop into Twitter briefly. Um, so I'll just use the chat and cover over the Twitter recommended stuff. Um, so here we are where I did a search for Intad 2021. Um, and I noticed that there are five notifications. Now these are notifications to my account, so that's not going to help me too much. But let's go to Intad 2021 again. With Twitter, you, you have to click on latest. Twitter will always take you to the top, which lets them do marketing. But go to the latest and you'll get what people said most recently. So if you're following along and, and doing things to help create the community, one thing you could do is write a short message, hashtag it in 2021 and pop it into Twitter. And a lot of decentralized learning communities are formed this way and this way only, just by using a hashtag in Twitter. Like I say, not a fan, because you, know, you only get, um, I can just these. Sorry about that. Yes, it's the middle of a pandemic, and somehow I still caught a cold. Not the COVID, but a cold. Go figure. Okay. Um, something you can use, if you haven't seen this already, and again, many people have, but I want to show you just in case, is TweetDeck, which is also by Twitter. And the neat thing about TweetDeck is, if you do a search here, it'll create a column, and here's the Inted column. And that allows you to keep up on this hashtag. But also, I can keep up on notifications. I can keep up on other searches, like here's one to something called OL Daily. Um, I can follow lists. Here's another one, e-learning, some other lists. So I can follow a number of different communities all from this one application. It's pretty useful, at least to my mind. 
An alternative that has become more popular recently is to use decentralized messaging services, for example, Mastodon. Mastodon, the URL is mastodon.social, and why don't I just pop that right in here. And that's a decentralized version of Twitter, and what happens with Mastodon is that there's no one central hub, rather there are many different hubs and you can join the hub that you want and this allows for you know a less public more intimate kind of discussion um, so what's the use of hash whatever if there's no discussion coming with it the misuse of inted 2021 and other channels is just twit clickbait Fair enough, Marcus. Don't use it if you don't want to. Everything is optional. Um, we'll keep going. But keep those comments coming. I like comments. I like feedback. I like responses. They make me happy. So, I think that these microservices are good just to get in touch, just so that we know each other exists. Um, and that's why I've recommended, you know, TweetDeck here, Twitter here, um, and Mastodon. It's a way that we can find each other. And this is one of the big challenges of decentralized communities is finding each other. The centralized community, you don't have to look. Everybody's there. And then you do the whole following, not following ritual. With a decentralized community, it's a bit harder. But using a hashtag, now everybody can find you because they have found your Twitter account or your Mastodon account or whatever. So even if you don't have anything to say just now, if you use the hashtag on Twitter, that way people will be able to find you. You'll be able to find each other. And one of the benefits is we're not limited by the conference organizers here, right? Um, if we ask the conference organizers who's here, they will tell us who's registered for the conference, which is nice and useful, but limited and our community is probably wider than the set of people who signed up for the conference. So let's see if anybody has put anything in yet. Um, okay, let's master now. We'll go back to Twitter. Go back to Twitter. This is tweet deck. So here we have Anna Estima. Hi, Anna. That's me. So not so much yet. That's interesting. I'm a bit surprised. I'm just going to go to the Twitter homepage again. Twitter. Search. Just to refresh. Latest. Just Anna. Well, like I said, right, the success of this depends on all of you. Um, right now we have a community on Twitter of one person <laughs> and me. So, hi Anna, welcome to our community. But there's no rush. Do it now, do it later. I know it's right in the middle of a talk, so it's sort of hard to stop and go do something else. But it's there, and it'll be there for, well, forever, right? Uh, for a long time, anyways. And maybe the mistake we're making here is trying to create a community rather than find a community. You know, it's common for educators to want to set up a community. And 
you know, here we are doing that, right, with INTED 2021. It sometimes works, but, uh, you know, it's often at too small a scale to work. Remember, we were talking earlier about participation rates, 1% or one-tenth of 1%. That means if you have 150 people at your conference, you might have 15 people actually talking, or maybe just 1.5 which rounds up to two. Not a very good community. Um, as well, it takes people away from tools and places they're already used to. Right? Maybe, and I don't know about all of you, maybe you don't use Twitter. Maybe I'm talking to the wrong, wrong crowd here. So if I set up a community on Twitter and then went to all of you and none of you use Twitter, well, that's a big barrier to our community. Um, and then the big danger, too, is that the community will just disappear when the conference or the course is finished. So, in many ways, finding community is better than creating community. Um, you know, once people have these tools, and, and to a large degree, they have them now. That's what makes this easier. Uh, the best community is the community that you're already using. The best tool is the tool you're already using. So, and, and that's to a large degree what I do in my own learning is use these communities that already exist. Here's our community for Inted. All over the world, different technologies, different interests, almost certainly different languages, probably a lot of Spanish language represented given that the uh, conference is organized out of Valencia, but you know, probably a fair amount of English, judging by the US participation, uh, Chinese, judging by the Chinese participation, different time zones. One of the things about a decentralized learning community is it's not all focused on a single event the way this talk is. And so there's the possibility of these communities developing over time and in different ways and on different platforms. And that's good. Now we move to probably a much more useful way to, to build our community, and that's through blogging. Or more accurately, I would say, through the use of blogging technology. Marcus complained earlier, well, you can't really have a conversation on Twitter. Totally right. I don't use Twitter or any micro-blogging service or any micro-content service, I should say, really to have these conversations. I use blogs or content similar to blogs. Now, whoops. You're probably aware of what a blog is, but I'm going to tell you anyways, because that's my job. Blo a blog is online content sorted by date. And so you get the terminology right. A blog is a collection of blog posts. The individual articles are called posts or not, or blog posts. And they're useful for regular columns, posting, discussion, whatever. Very often, instead of a website, a community will have an official blog, sometimes called a mother blog. Um, I noticed Inted didn't really do that. I was able to snag both the WordPress and the blogger domain name for Inted, uh, which kind of surprised me. And it's also an excellent activity for community members. So many of you will already have a blog. But if you haven't, this is your opportunity to create a blog. We just saw the annoyance of WordPress. So I'm not going to recommend that at this point in time. Let's go to Blogger. Blogger is owned by Google. So still some trade-offs, right? But, uh, and, and here, this is my blogger account already. Let's open up 
Edge because I never use Edge, which means I don't have any accounts on it. www.blogger.com. Did I type V's? No, yes, I did. And this is what it looks like if you don't have an account. But just click on create your blog. Google will make you sign in with a Google account. And once you've signed in, you'll be taken to the start page, which kind of looks like this. It, you'll go through a few screens to set up your blog, and I'm not going to go through those. But I encourage you to go through those. And, and again, there are videos in that which will help you on the web. And the idea here is to ultimately create a new blog post. Now it's a lot easier to write a blog post in Blogger as opposed to WordPress. Um, you just type your title. Hello in Ted 2021. Here I am. And publish. Oh wait, let's give it a tag or as they call it a label. In Ted 2021. Confirm. And it's posted. And we can view it. And there it is. It's very boring because all I wrote is here I am. But uh, that's all I needed to do for this. So either now or through through the uh, conference, I'm going to recommend that you either create a blog or if you already have a blog, create a blog post. And we'll talk about what to talk about here in just a second. But create a blog post using the Inted tag. And that gets some of your comments, your discussion into the world. Now, as I mentioned, there are many ways to do this, and I'm going to come back to the slides. So, edu blogs, free for educators, bloggers, free, medium, e, Tumblr is free and easy, WordPress. Excuse me. Um, and there are other WordPress hosting sites. And there are ways you can host WordPress for yourself. Totally up to you. But for something quick and easy, Blogger. You don't like using Google, I get that. But Blogger is still quick and easy. Now, I've lost sight of my chat. And I would like my chat back. Where is it? Have I covered it over? Sorry, I'm just trying to find my chat. <laughs> Where did it go? Maybe I closed it? I couldn't have closed it. Oh, good. <laughs> there it is. All right. Sorry about that. I just wanted to say, oh, thank you for the bless you, Claudia. Uh, what about... Yeah, so calculation is correct. 93 people are online at this presentation. 1% comes down to one person in your Twitter group. And that's why you don't want to limit these communities to a class or even to a conference. You want them to be wider because, you know, I mean, lurking is what they call legitimate peripheral participation. Um, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, you have to go with the math, and the math says, really, you need a larger community. That's why conferences have to try so hard, you know, with the startup screens and the built-in chats to get people to talk. And this conference, 
created a whole bunch of chat rooms. But if you think about it, 1%, um, so let's say a thousand people signed up for the conference. So 1% is going to be a hundred people. But if we have 10 chat rooms, now we only have 10, but we actually have something like 30 chat rooms. So at best, we might have three people in each chat room. We've just divided all the participation, all the discussion into tiny, tiny little groups. That's good for those tiny little groups if there's enough people and if they're engaged enough to have a good conversation. But it makes it so much harder, doesn't it? wonder if anyone else has tweeted anything. Let's refresh. Latest. Nope, still only in a... I'm so, so sad. <laughs> okay. Now, in our community, we're going to need lists. Minimally, we're going to need a list of Twitter handles. That's why people are we want people to post on Twitter or we might want to keep a list of blogs so there are many ways to keep lists I only found one really simple way which is list moz so we're going to use oh, actually in those chat rooms says Marcus are between 5 and 34 people all of them every one of them it's interesting uh, come back to that. Well, no, let's let's have a look. I'm curious. <laughs> okay, so see, cause let's let's pick. Uh, look at this. Uh, okay, you may only be in three chat rooms at once. So I guess I'm in some chat rooms that I didn't know I was in. <laughs> Yeah, and Tim says, but the few I looked into had minimal discussion. So let's remove myself some, from some chat rooms. Now let's look at one. Oh. Five people are in it, but I see no mess. Or 15 people are in it, but I see no messages. Um, 13 are in it, I see no messages. <laughs> so... You see, and you see, each time I click on one of these, I've joined it and I don't leave it. And that's how we're getting all of this membership. Or maybe it's a private room. I don't think they can't all be private rooms, right? No, because private is something completely separate. This is all the, these are public rooms, not private rooms. Upper left. No, private is person to person chat. Interesting. But if this is about getting contact, fine. I agree. Okay, continuing on. That's one of the things about me doing a talk. I'm easily distracted. I don't know if that's a good idea. So, I'm going to put lists to the side for, for a moment and talk briefly about collaborative writing. Now, not as decentralized as I would like, but again, we're always making these trade-offs, right? So collaborative writing, the idea is one document, many writers, and there are many uses for collaborative writing, um, use it to work together, collect information, etc. One example that I set up during the pandemic is your quick tech guide. Oops. Works if you click on the actual link and not the. So here it is. And this is an open public document. When I first started it up, um, here it is. When I first started it up, oops, didn't mean to do that. I'm just going to move this out of the way. Um, I allowed anyone to edit. But he can't see the history. I'm missing something there. Okay. 
Um, oh, I see. I'm getting blank in the chat because I can't see the history of that room. Okay, that makes sense to me. That does make a lot of sense. That's too bad, though. You should be able to see the history, shouldn't you? Oh, well. That's an aside. So, now... I've set this up so that you can make suggestions, but you can't edit because I had people who were just doing random edits to see if I was still maintaining it. And I had some people adding spam, etc. Most of this talk is based on this document. And in fact, but in fact, there's a lot more in this document than there is in this talk. But this is a really good example of how collaborative editing can help a community build up a common document. You're not on mute and we can hear you on the telephone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but we're going to use it for something a little more practical. Let's move the chat back. Point over. And we're going to create our community again our decentralized community so here is the link to go to and that'll take you to this longer link and i'll just put that in the chat if you want to go directly there And this is a collaborative instant community document. And you can see the people coming into the document. See, people are participating. They just didn't want to post things on Twitter. And now everybody can add their name. You know, it's a bit tricky. So you can add your name. If you have a blog, add your blog address right here. Um, I don't talk about email lists in this presentation, which is too bad, but I just, I had to cut out something just for time. And even with the time, look at it, it's already 9.05. So an hour in. Twitter, and again, everything is optional, right? So you put in whatever address, whatever you want, right? Um... If you want to put in your blog address, do that. If you want to put in your email, do that. Otherwise, don't, right? And the other thing is, yeah, somebody's already added some stuff, right? I've picked four things, but you can add another column of your own. Somebody's added Clubhouse. I uh, could add Mastodon, right? If you have a Mastodon account. And mine is at downs at mastodon.social, for example. We can make these wider, too, so that they're easier to read. So, to create our instant online community, we can get started by filling in this information. So I'll leave you with all of that. We'll come back and see if anybody's typed anything in the Twitter, and they haven't. Oh, here we go. Uh, what is the role of language in your notion of instant learning community? Yeah, that's a great question. And historically, these learning communities have been all single language, haven't they? so annoying. Um, I think we're just about at the end of that as a problem. And here's why. Um, we have already the capacity to generate transcripts as we speak. And we have already automated and pretty good automated translations that are almost instantaneous. So we're 
just at the point where our audio and video services can provide instant translation for us. And if they can do that, then language ceases to be a factor. Now, I think it will always be a factor because different people see the world differently depending on the language that they use. And different expressions are different, different uh, idiomatic expressions are different in different languages. But for basic communication, getting the idea across, we're almost there. Let's see how our document is doing. Oh, pretty good. Mostly email. Oh, we got somebody put an ORCID number in for blog. That's interesting. Um, and we'll see that that will actually break some things. I'm not sure I'll demonstrate that, but it'll break things later. But that's okay. Still useful information, isn't it? Maybe I'll create another column for ORCID if that's what you use. All right. Moving on, because we're running out of time. Feed readers. This is old technology, but it's brilliant technology. So now that I have blog addresses, or in theory I have blog addresses, there's one. Um, it's a home page. I'm not sure if it'll be a blog, but it might be. So I'm going to copy this and just hang on to that. So I just, you know, I just used control C to copy it. So now a feed reader takes content from many different blogs and puts them all into a single location. So let's have a look at a feed reader. I use Feedly. Yeah, actually, I, I even pay the money for Pro Feedly because it's worth worth me paying the money and I have the money but there is a free version and and there are free versions of most RSS readers on the slide there's a selection of them these are all different websites that I follow so some analytics ed community and actually, it's only showing me, no, it's showing me all of them. Some some companies. See, look at all the different companies I follow. Ed Media and Culture. Ed Pedagogy. Various people. So I've organized them into categories. I subscribe overall. I'm, I forget how many feeds altogether. A lot. I think it's about 700, give or take. Um, and you might think, well, that's, that's crazy, that's ridiculous. And it is crazy and ridiculous, but it's still really useful. And to add a feed, I just click on this plus sign. And remember, I copied virtualscience.it. I just paste that in there. Hit enter. And no feeds with matching titles. You see, that's, that's part of the problem here. So let's go to this website. Oops, that's a search. So unfortunately, there is no feed for this, which means that they're not sharing their content using RSS. And one of the reasons why I recommend that people choose blogs instead of just a website like this is because a blogger website will have RSS. So for example, this one, if I just took that blog address and put it into a feed reader, see, it will find something. And then it gives me the option to follow it. And once I follow it, then anytime something new is posted in that blog, I will be able to read it in this feed reader. This is so incredibly useful because it allows our community to use blogs 
and each person in the community can choose to follow all, some, or even none, although they're not really participating in the community if they follow none, of the members in the community. It connects us together. So if you created, or if you create at some time in the future, a blog, then I'm just looking for the window and I don't see it. Then put the information in our instant community page. So here, here's another one, multi competencias. So multiple competencies or multi competencies. Let's see if they have an RSS feed. Let's go back to Feedly. And the verdict is, oh, it's taking time, that's not a good sign. Ah, there we go. So they do have an RSS feed. Let's have a quick look at their page and see what they have. Um, there we go. So. See all, all of these little links down here, but they don't have a little RSS button. Sim, that means yes. Okay. So they have an RSS feed. I wonder if they knew they had one. Because I don't see the little link anywhere for it. But RSS readers can detect the feed even if there isn't an explicit link. If they're using, say, WordPress. And I'll bet you they're using WordPress for this website or something similar. So, what you should do to create an instant learning community is each of you create your own RSS reader account. And as I mentioned, there are various ones. Here are five, six different RSS readers. And there are many more options besides that. To Portugal only. <laughs> Um, many RSS readers besides that but these are some of the most popular like I say I use Feedly and you can start collecting feeds from different blogs so you see how our instant community is taking shape here right people who create blogs can put their blog address in here and then when they've done that, I can collect the blog address and follow it in my feed reader. I think that's pretty cool, personally. So, there are ways you can find RSS feeds, even if you don't know. And also, if you're using something non-standard, look for this little orange button and that'll point you to an RSS feed. Here's the principle. Here's the idea. My whole talk is on this slide. They write something. Or maybe more accurately, they produce some content. You read it, you write something, and crucially, you link back to what they wrote. <laughs> Is the future of collaboration a good filter option? I think the success finding something on the internet comes with better filtering and not by collecting more blogs and input. Conversation isn't about finding content on the internet, right? Content, conversation and community is about linking together with people that you know or people that you come to know, and then having conversations back and forth. I think that if you start each day and simply search for content that you're looking for and use that, that works, but it leaves you disconnected from the community. You don't actually form any connections with the community. You don't have any dialogue or discussion. It's sort of like going to the library, picking books and reading them, 
but never talking to anyone. And you can learn that way. You can sort of learn that way. But you don't learn as effectively, I think, as you would if you have this library, you pull some books off the shelf, you do the search or use the filter, but you also have this community that you talk to. And this community, everybody in this community is also doing that. And the community acts as the filter. And I think that a good learning community is a better filter, certainly right now, a better filter than machine filters. I think that. Maybe in the future that'll change. But right now, the best way to find and work with new content about something that you're learning is through a community. But you have to go through this process. It requires participation and engagement. It's a bit harder than just doing a Google search. Okay. So, the big question is, you've read stuff in Feedly or whatever reader you're using, how do you respond, right? And there are different ways to respond. You can save the article, you can forward the article. Um, I use Feedly on my phone a lot. And so here it is on my phone. And uh, one of the things that I have, and it's, it's interesting just to come back to what Marcus said, I have about 700 and some odd subscriptions. So I actually use some artificial intelligence that's built into Feedly to give me a priority list Although, of course, I can always choose all. So, now that's a feature that I pay for. Over time, that sort of thing will just become standard. So, let's say that I find something. Here's something from the Brains blog that looks interesting. I could save it, but that's just saving it for me. Or, there are different ways of sharing it. And where are they? They're gone. <laughs> Maybe this is a bad one. Oh, I can add a note down here. All right. Uh, I'm not very smart sometimes. Okay, so let's pick something from improving ad adult improving academic outcomes among adolescents. I can click on this little thing up here, and that allows me to share. And now here are the other applications on my phone that I can share it with. One place I can share is, where did it go? Um, Mastopain, or there's another one called Tusky, which is an interface, there it is to Mastodon, so I can share this article on Mastodon, or I can share it on Flipboard, or I can just open it up in Firefox, or I can mail it to myself, or I can put it in Google Keep, or I can add it to a resource called Pocket, which is something that I use quite a bit. So all of these different ways of sharing, but to me, ultimately, what they all lead to is a way for me to get that information back into my blog so that I can write about it. So all the other stuff, the social networking, etc., is just a step in a longer process. What I really want to do, ultimately, is put it in my blog and actually respond to it. Simply retweeting it or whatever isn't really the option for me. So the mechanism by which all of this works 
can be called conversions. And I've set up using a tool called IFTVT some ways of working with my content. For example, if I save an article for later, then it saves it to Pocket for me. And then if something is saved in Pocket, it creates a link on a Tumblr blog that I have. And that blog is just a place where I store those links. I don't actually advertise it or use it at all. If I create a new photograph, it creates a photo post on Blogger for me. And then that photo post is sent as an email back to me so that I'm confirming that the photo post has been created. And it'll also post a tweet with the image to Twitter, which is why if you look at my Twitter home account, you see so many photos. And those were all uploaded originally to Flickr and then forwarded to Twitter, um, which is where the chain ends. And, and there isn't really very much discussion thereafter because it's Twitter. There's no place to discuss. The more interesting is when we discuss things. And we're almost at the session. So these are the points where oh, that'll actually close on. It's just the dynamics of these conversations. Marcus says, sharing with common goals would make it more efficient. Yeah, everything is more efficient with common goals, but you know what? There are no common goals. Everybody has their own goals. Everybody has their own objectives. We're all different. And so we need a mechanism that allows us to work together even if we have different goals. That's why I say cooperation rather than collaboration. And the idea of a community, as opposed to, say, a company, is that we're all cooperating. We each have our own goals. We each have our own houses, our own families to raise, our own jobs to do, our own hobbies to pursue. But we still interact and share resources and have conversations because they help us. They don't help us necessarily do the same thing all together but they still help us. And it's this diversity of goals that creates a community rather than, like I say, a company or a political movement or whatever. And personally, I'd rather live in a community. So, and you notice even in that discussion, I'm doing this, this dialogues, create the golden goals together. I'm just skeptical about that. What I'm doing in my conversation with the chat room is also what we do in the community general. Generally, first of all, show that you understand what they're saying by restating their argument or their main point, maybe offering an example. And that's what I've been doing. In fact, I'm putting their conversation right on the screen. And then adding something, even if it's a disagreement, adding something to what they've contributed. There are many different kinds of responses, but the key here is that in our decentralized learning community, everything is a response to something. You know, it's really rare to see somebody just, you know, with a blank sheet of paper or a blank screen in front of them magically come up with an idea all by themselves. The trick to making any of this work is to always be responding to something. Usually we read something and then we respond to it and link back to it. That's the general mechanism. Over time, we read something from outside the community, link back to it and respond to it. And then the different kinds of responses, well, you know, I've written a couple of articles um, talking about all the different ranges of responses. You can add examples, explain, argue against, compare it with other things. There are all kinds of ways of responding. 
But the idea here is to build the conversation, to take what they have created and in some way add to it. I sometimes use the expression aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. And here I'm talking about the remixing, repurposing part, actually engaging with what they've created and moving the dialogue further. And as an aside, that's what we don't have with Twitter and Facebook and the rest. We don't have this engaging with what someone said. I think if we did, we might like and follow less frequently. Is the general idea to form a meta organization with a higher level of creativity and also personal learning? Uh, in a word, yes. Something like that, right? Except Again, we're not all working toward creating a meta-organism. The meta-organism, more properly, emerges from our taking individual actions. And that's an important, important point. I have 32, more than 32,000 examples of this process on my website. And you can see them all because I share them all. And this is near the end of that list. But if you just hit the previous button, these examples go on, well, except for that one, indefinitely. Well, you can click on that previous button more than 30,000 times. You'll see examples. And again, this is the model, right? This is the way I present it on my website. You can present it differently on, on Blogger, but the idea is find something you want to talk about and talk about it. And then link back. All of these, each one of these posts, you click on the title, it links back to the original thing that I'm talking about. This connection is what creates the community. And me, I see myself as a part of this larger learning community that exists. It was a very amorphous kind of thing, right? There weren't any walls or barriers or anything like that. I mean, it's not a company. You might be saying, this is all old. What's this, this old guy doing talking about all this old stuff? Yeah, it's old technology, but there's new elements being added to all of this now. We, as an internet, have kind of gone down a dead-end road with closed communities, LMSs, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, even things like YouTube. Uh, we've kind of gone down this dead-end street. And collectively, we're pulling back, and there's a lot of technology being developed now. And I, I haven't talked about it because using that technology is hard. And I wanted to focus on easy for this conference, for this community, so that people could do something. Turns out it was still too hard to do something while listening to the talk, but that's okay. Um, and we're going to see things like sharing independent websites and forming these connections across different individuals, across different sites. That is all going to become a lot easier. So going back to this 20-year-old picture, recentering on it is what allows you to envision and adapt to the kind of decentralized learning community that's coming very shortly. Now that's all the time I have. I have more slides, right, because I talk about different kinds of contents and I talk about, you know, for example, here we have individual sessions and, you know, there's a whole bunch of content that's being created by a whole bunch of really uh, talented people that 
you know, sort of goes to a website to die, and I don't want it to die. So if you go to their content, look at their content, go through their slides, and write a blog post about that, you'll be doing a service. Or maybe it's not a blog post. Maybe it's a video. Maybe it's a community discussion around that content. There are so many ways that you can create content today. It doesn't have to be a blog post. But the idea is the same. Find something. Read it or watch it or whatever. Talk about it. And link back to what you were talking about. And all of this can be shared using RSS. So now it's over to you. I can't create this community for you. And, and maybe this won't happen in this particular conference. And that's okay. Um, but these are the kinds of learning communities that are forming that people are already using only outside the more traditional learning system. And the question is always, are you as an individual willing to create and contribute to that community? That's how you keep these things open and free, right? What will you contribute? And then can you take these experiences back home with you? And that's my talk. And I hope you found that useful. And I hope it inspires you to think more deeply about decentralized learning communities. Thank you, and I'm Stephen Downs.